Having created a new farm layout, you have to consider ways in which the units can be linked so as you can get around the place efficiently. We've all sworn and cursed, often very loudly, when we've had to move sheep or cattle from the front of the place to the back of the place, taking them through five or so paddocks past all the other animals and trying not to get them boxed. It's a curse of a job, to say the least. Well, here on the Potter farms, they've really got on top of those problems. A key feature of their farm plans is the establishment of big laneways like these. They go through the middle of the property or right around the perimeter. And the feature is that all the paddocks on the place open onto those laneways. And so the movement of stock, big trucks, machinery, even people, is made so very much easier. In planning your access, you have to decide your own priorities, be they to save time with stock movement, to provide reliable grain delivery to the silo, or to be able to view all your units from your car as you drive round the place. On the surface, there are extra costs involved, extra fencing, gravel and land lost to production. But there are ways to offset these costs. It's a problem solving task really. To save on resurfacing costs, access can be located on ridges where the ground is often more stable. Anyway, the ridges usually provide the best view of a property. As you'll see in the next program on vegetation, there are advantages in planting the ridges. And in doing this, you can secure your laneways, minimize erosion, and create an effective shelter belt. It's really by working through ideas like these that you find the optimum solution for your land and for your production. For example, Ross Kitchen had a really difficult property here with a hilly farm and a creek running through it. Well, we originally started off with two large paddocks there. They were both 120 acres. And what we've done is we've fenced them off to land type and we've uh, divided them into seven paddocks and we've got a laneway running up the middle of them. But it runs to every paddock and it actually goes in a complete circle around the farm. It's just uh, a lot easier to, to manage the farm. For example, uh, if I'm working with sheep, I can bring sheep up uh, to the yards and when I've finished wor working with them, they can simply just be let out of the yards and they'll find their own way back to their own paddock. The laneway provides quick access and easy supervision. The sheep find their own way to the open gate. The laneway is a useful grazing area. It gives excellent shelter in extreme conditions and the farmers graze it down and use it as a fire break in summer. In their fencing programs, the farmers tended to opt for traditional fencing. For example, Ross Kitchen made this choice because as a loan operator, he can't always be around to monitor the fences or deal with any immediate problems. Put the fence up and completely forget about that job for a long, long time to come. I just feel it's a lifetime job. That's the way I view my fencing. On the other hand, Andrew Campbell, the project's manager, is adamant that as far as cost, flexibility and efficiency are concerned, electric fencing has more than come into its own. He says that farmers need to consider its advantages carefully. It's quicker to construct, can be installed temporarily, and it costs about a third to one-fifth of the conventional fence price. And that's a critical factor if we're to undertake major revegetation in Australia. Bill Spears, Bruce Milne and Peter Waldron all trialled electric fencing. Fencing was uh, a six-wire plane uh, that is electrified some, some of the wires. Uh, because it's a one-man uh, farm, if I want to go away, I want to put up enough fence so that it was a visual barrier or it was a, a phys enough physical barrier to keep stock apart or out of trees. Or... We decided, knowing that we were going to do a lot of fencing, that we would continue with the electric fence option, believing it to be the most effective form of fencing. And as a second but huge bonus, much the cheaper by massive amounts, in fact, and it gave us great flexibility. We were able to move around our land shapes on our farm very easily. 
with a radical electric fence option that we planned carefully and put our heart and soul in to try and make it work really well. And uh, we found in our experience that it does. And we're able to say to our farm friends and the, the two around our farm, okay, I understand that some of you are a bit skeptical, but, but just have a look at the trees on our farm. There are 35,000 of them and they are well protected by the electric fence option that we've chosen. If you've got electric fencing, you've always got an electric fence story. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. was that like? And, and uh, my dad, who's just turned 80, was helping us shift a, a mob of sheep out of a little holding yard, which had an awkward, sharp corner in it. So he, he took a new young dog down on a chain along with an old dog, and they were going, he was going to tie them in this sharp corner to stop the sheep from running in there. <laughs> and, and he clipped the clip the dog chain to the electrified wire, forgetting it was electrified, the young <laughs> dog, right? And it started yelping around and tangled itself up with the other dog and then, and then wrapped the chain around Dad's leg. So <laughs> the two dogs and Dad were standing there getting <laughs> shock, shock, <laughs> shock. <laughs> and there was no way out and I was standing about 100 metres away. I thought, well, I'm not going to rush up and help. So I walked up slowly. <laughs> and the only way out for Dad was to unclip the dog chain. As with your farm layout, the access routes and the use of laneways involve considerable trial and error. There's a great deal to consider for ever trying to match your management needs with the lie of the land. Experiment with the routes on some spare overlays or perhaps photocopies of your plan until they begin to fit in with your layout. The time you'll save in the long run is well worth the preparation. I've worked it out, yes, on mob movements and time it takes for each uh, mob to uh, come home and to go back out again and it does save me a week's work mm. each year. As well, uh, it's a lot less stressful on stock instead of them having to hang around until I finish the mob with whatever operation that uh, I'm doing. Uh, the first of them are heading back to the paddock as soon as I'm finished with them and uh, very often I'm only halfway through the mob and uh, the first will be back feeding in, in their paddock. So it's a lot less stressful than hanging around for perhaps a day especially in summer when it's hot and uh, dry, uh, that must have some effect on them. We don't view them as areas out of production. They are like little paddocks that you can intensively graze and yeah. they can double as fire breaks in the summertime, having made use of the feed that's, that's in, in the yeah. lane ways in the springtime, graze it down hard. We've all heard plenty of cliches about water, a farm's most important resource. And yet that's exactly what water is, a resource. And what we've got to do is make water work for production rather than against it. Every farmer is aware of the problems that water can create. Too little water or too much water. Seepage and bogs, erosion, flooding, not enough water. Having developed a basic plan with management units and access routes, the next step is managing the property's watering system. And the main strategy here is to satisfy the farm's production needs and to restrict, or better still reverse, any problem areas. It means that all water strategies are designed in tune with the needs of the whole property. And one of the important tools for achieving all that is careful siting of vegetation. Amongst its numerous roles on farms, a well-planned vegetation system can work as a filter to clean water as it flows into storage areas. It can reduce salinity levels by lowering the water table. It can secure eroded areas and increase the soil's water retaining capacity on the upper slopes, so reducing runoff in the first place. In planning water distribution on a grazing place, and if you're lucky enough to have a choice, be it underground, a permanent stream or surface water, 
then a selection has to be made based on water quality, consistency of supply, and of course, the cost of tapping into it. Where there's a need to store water, try to catch it in the high part of the property where the water is cleaner. In low-lying areas, the entrance to storages may have to be vegetated to filter the water as it flows in. In higher areas, where runoff is creating problems, the long-term strategy of planting out the ridges can reduce the surface flow and increase the quality of the pasture surrounding the ridges. Already on the demonstration farms, four years of growth on these plantations has been enough to see a marked improvement in the productive use of water on and in the surrounding areas. Okay, we've got too much water here and what we need to do is try and use it wherever it falls on the farm before it gets to these problem areas. So what we've done further up slope uh, is firstly to put in a catchment drain up there which runs the water into a, a high dam which we're able to feed out to our stock to drink. To help the drain we've put in a large plantation of trees up there so our trees are acting as moisture mops further up the slope. Also more productive pastures are helping us up there but they can't cope with it all so some water ends up down here in our saw area in, in what we call our basin paddock. So we've had to try and treat these areas and uh, what we've done in this case is to frame out the basin paddock in the first place with uh, a wide plantation of trees. So we've got it surrounded with trees, what we call the wicket keeper effect because we're hoping that those trees will be dense enough in their immediate vicinity to lower the underground water table, create a kind of trough and stop the tendency for outward spread of salt. Then we've moved within the paddock and obviously we can't cover the whole paddock with trees, we need to grow beef and wool, so we've turned to pasture. Pastures that tolerate high salt levels in water. Tall American wheatgrass, phalaris, Demeter fescue, strawberry clover in particular. And it's been a pretty good success story, they've done really well. We've not lowered the underground water table here yet, but we are living with the problem and, and producing well. So uh, it's, it's actually put money into our pocket short term. We've changed this area from carrying less than two sheep to the acre to carrying uh, about five sheep to the acre. So I think it's a, I, I actually think these saw areas are good spots to start out in because it gives you a short term re return and it can finance farm plan works further out across the farm that aren't quite so sore yet and, and, and have been producing relatively better than this spot. Poorly drained areas should be examined to see whether they can be made more productive through better drainage, but being sure that the diverted water doesn't create a new problem. The depth of the topsoil, the clay types, and even the trees in the area can give you a pretty good idea of whether drainage is practical or not. It may be that the water causing the wetness can be diverted or even used up before it gets to the wet area. If it's not practical to drain a soggy area, consider it as a possible wetland where the entire farm's excess can be diverted, perhaps developing a fire break and increasing the wildlife. In connecting the water system around your property, you may prefer to install fewer storage tanks that can be piped to all your paddocks rather than having storages in every paddock. Many of the principles of water management on a grazing operation apply to cropping properties. At all times, try to enhance your best growing areas and plan to protect them from runoff or drainage. The land types, the slopes and the gullies will determine the methods to be used. In some cases, contour banks will be called for where slope and gully patterns threaten the topsoil. In developing a water strategy, Peter Waldron has had to handle some tough salting problems which have affected his main water supply. By planting out this creek, he's effectively checked the levels of salt which had been rising. But he keeps a close check on the water table through 12 bores he put into the ground. Around the farm I've got a dozen of these shallow bores, just PVC casing. 
that use the fox whistle to measure the water level. In this case, it's pretty close to the surface. In fact, it's 320 millimetres. I measure them every fortnight and record it so that I can see what the water level is doing. We'll take a, a water sample. Put her in the jar and test it to see. It's 2,240 parts per million song content. Uh, and so that's really good for early in December. Five years ago, we had the water tested in those uh, dams that we were using for stock water uh, before. And some of them were, in fact, quite salty and uh, becoming unsuitable for stock water. So as in this case, we've fenced out the worst of the, of the dams. We've planted a lot of trees around the uh, dam. And since then, a lot of grass has grown and is also using up the salty water. We're higher in the catchment in here, and it's important that we do this type of work to lessen the uh, salty water that runs downstream. The salting in, in this district uh, is quite bad in the, in the gullies. If we could get something like this into, uh, into the heads of these gullies, we'd have considerable effect on the water leaving this district. Ross Kitchen faced several problems in preparing his plan. He needed to fence out a creek which was becoming salt affected and eroded, as well as posing a danger to stock with its steep sides. This turned out to be a fairly major priority in his planning. By developing this large paddock into seven smaller units, he effectively brought his stock movements into closer control, improved his pasture management and lifted the use of water where it fell. Well, this is our new pasture establishment. We've used three different species here. We've got Phalaris and Curry Coxford, which are both deep-rooted grasses, and rye grass. And we've plant in this paddock, we've planted a, a plantation up the top with scattered trees, single trees over the whole paddock. Um, we're using the water where it falls, and uh, as the, the water filters down, the water is filtered down through the grass and uh, filtering out the pesticides and uh, fertilisers and as it runs into the creek it's fresh water. At the same time his water distribution had to be changed according to the new layout. He had to get water into the new units up the slope. Yes we've, uh, we've fenced a lot of the hilltops off into large paddocks and we're using a hydraulic ram pump to pump this water to a, a large 10,000 gallon tank which then articulates to the various paddocks. As a result of the original clearing on the ridge, excess water seeps through to create this boggy area, which he intends to tackle by fencing the damaged area and planting the ridge. Ross's water strategy is a good example of adapting a farm's natural resources to your water needs and building these into the overall plan. Better than anyone else, you'll know your water requirements. It helps to check the water quality regularly for salt levels and turbidity. Identify the cause of wet areas and the problems with machinery or stock access and treat the source of the problem. When you have a good idea of where the excess water and poor quality water is breaking out, as well as the probable cause, consult other farmers and government officers who may be able to advise you. Very often, water requirements or problems are treated without thinking about the real causes or the long-term consequences. Always go to the source of the problem. If it's salt, plant out the sources. Lift the pasture productivity and encourage the farmers upstream to do the same thing. Or if erosion's the problem and you've got a gully something like this, it may not be appropriate to put a retaining wall in, or a contour to redirect the flow. Thought should be given to where the water's coming from. Hopefully, David McDonald's plantings will have a significant effect on the salted gully in 10 years or so, maybe sooner. Go back to your plan and work through all your farm's requirements until an optimal control and use of the farm's water 
emerges. The pot has got us back further up the hill, if, if you understand the meaning. We, yes, we've right. been doing a lot of Band-Aid work for you know, mm. 20 odd years, probably. Um, and then, you know, suddenly we're starting to learn that that wasn't all we needed to do. We needed to move further back up the slopes yeah. and start treating the areas where the problems were coming from.